Welcome to Missouri Caves and Speleology. I'm Toby Dogweiler, and in this module, we're going to talk about caves as climate archives. In another module, we provided a general overview of climate change and its impacts globally. And in this module, we want to dive into how, how come and how caves are an important resource for learning about past climates. Um, first of all, let's recap a little bit. We know from direct observations, and by direct observations, I mean people reading thermometers, recording those observations, and averaging them all together all over the Earth, we know that over the past 150 years or so that temperatures have been steadily rising. Uh, that trend continues right up through today, through this whole period that we call the instrumental period or the instrumental record since we've been systematically recording these temperature observations. And um, our understanding of the climate system, our modeling suggests that, strongly suggests that these temperatures will continue to rise throughout the next century or two or more, and in fact will probably accelerate in the coming decades. Um, but because humans have only been making these systematic observations since about the 1880s, and of course there are some records that go back further than that, but they're a little more scattered, the instrumentation wasn't as good, they're not as reliable. So our instrumental record goes back to the 1880s, but to really understand how climate is changing, we need to go back much further than that. Hundreds, thousands, tens of thousands, even millions or billions of years. And caves are important in that they give us access to climate records that go back at least hundreds of thousands of years, which is important because the current climate, which technically we're in an ice age, we're in an interglacial period of an ice age, meaning this is the warm part of an ice age, but over the last couple million years, definitely over the last few hundred thousand years, we've been bouncing back between glacial period, interglacial, and right now we're in a glacial period. Um, but caves have recorded in high detail these changes and lock them into records that we as scientists can access. Uh, this next graph on, on the, this slide shows long-term atmospheric carbon dioxide levels. And if you look at the x-axis here, you'll see that on the left, the uh, time frame goes all the way back to more than 400,000 years ago. Um, this is global atmospheric CO2 level, CO2 levels. So the amount of carbon dioxide in the air we're breathing. What you see is that through most of this 400,000 year period, carbon dioxide was high at certain times um, and low at other times. And the highest it ever got was between 280 and 300 parts per million until about 1950 when it passed that threshold and since that time has shot up in that straight line. Um, to 400. So what we're seeing today are unprecedented, unprecedented carbon dioxide levels in the atmosphere. Well, how do we know this? How do we know what carbon dioxide levels were in the atmosphere? Well, good question. Let me answer that. We know it because of we have collected proxy records um, from things like speleothems in caves. And I'll explain that in a second. But we've gotten this data out of various geologic records that are recorded in rocks and sediments and, and other records like tree rings. Talk about that in a second. Why would we want to know? Why do we care how much CO2 there was in the atmosphere? Well, we know through lots of scientific study that the more CO2 there is in the atmosphere, the warmer the average temperature is going to be. The less CO2 we have in the atmosphere, the cooler the atmospheric temperature is. So when we look at this graph where we see CO2 going up and down, it, it um, captures very well the temperature trends through this time. Um, higher CO2 levels in this graph correlate with warmer periods of Earth history lower CO2 levels, cooler periods of Earth history. So the glaciations that we talked about a moment ago, those are occurring when this graph is bottoming, bottoming out in terms of atmospheric CO2 at around 180 parts per million. That's when it's cold enough on Earth for these glaciers to form and grow and cover much of North America and Europe and so forth. All right, so before we go any further, let's cover some terminology that I'm going to use throughout this module. First, archives. I've already said that word a couple times, I think. Um, these archives are climate records from sediments, rocks, tree rings, pollen, and other geologic repositories. Um, 
these things by in the process of being deposited or formed or growing record information from the atmosphere or from other parts of the Earth system that we can use to reconstruct what climate was like when they formed. Um, proxies, next term. Well, proxy is just any data set that we can use to directly infer past climates. So in the previous graph, I showed you a graph of CO2, but I explained to you that that graph, even though it's of CO2, gives us a good indication of what the trends and changes in temperature were. So CO2 is a good proxy for temperature in the climate system. Paleoclimate. This is just simply any climate of the geologic past um, generally from before recorded human history. When we talk about paleoclimates, we could be talking about a climate hundreds of years ago, thousands of years ago, or even billions with a B, billions of years ago. Speleothems are um, cave formations such as stalagmites, stalactites, flowstone, etc. the pretty stuff that forms in caves. Um, and they're a type of cave deposit, a sedimentary deposit, but unlike a sand or a gravel which are laying down by water that washes those materials into a cave, speleothems are chemically precipitated. So the material, the calcite, and calcite's the mineral that forms limestone, and caves usually form in limestone, as the water moves through the limestone and dissolves the limestone, which is calcite, that water moves into the cave, and then because of some geochemistry, um, that calcite is precipitated back out of solution as these pretty things, stalagmites and stalactites. We'll talk a little bit about more about that later. Now before we get into the full-fledged climate discussion here in caves, I want to talk about some of the ways that caves are used to reconstruct other things in our geologic history. Um, this figure shows a schematic diagram that was put together by a fellow named Greg Stock and some of his co-authors a little over a decade ago, um, they set about to answer an important question in a different part of geology. How fast are the Sierra Nevada mountains in California uplifting? So the Sierra Nevada mountains are an actively forming mountain range in North America um, and they've been lifting up for at least several millions of years. Um, as things go on out there on that plate boundary formed by the San Andreas Fault between the Pacific Plate and North American Plate that causes all the excitement of earthquakes and so forth that you've heard about. Well, the mountains are lifting up. It turns out that if we know what sea level is or if sea level is steady, the rivers that form the valleys in those mountains want to stay at the same elevation. So as the mountains uplift, the rivers will at the same time cut their valleys deeper so that the net result is the mountains lift up but the river stays at about the same level. You can think about this if the river was a hot knife and the mountains are butter, we would keep the hot knife in place and lift the butter through it, sort of push the butter up into the knife where remember the knife is the river. So the river is recording sort of an elevation that we can use as a reference. Well from previous modules you'll know that hydrologically caves tend to form at about the level that the river currently is. So whenever you have a river stay at one place vertically in its valley for a long period of time, and if you have the right conditions and the right type of bedrock, type of bedrock a cave will form at about that same elevation. So if we look in this diagram, we see that there are several, one, two, three, four, five, maybe six caves that they've got shown in this diagram. And the caves are at different elevations in this um, on the sides of the mountain within the stream valley. Well, uh, if we assume that those caves formed at the river level, and we know how high those caves are today, let's say that Boyden Cave is now, um, oh, it looks like Boyden Cave is about 50 meters, roughly 50 yards above the current level of the river. And if we know that Boyden Cave was 1.4 million years old because we've dated some uh, speleothems within that cave, and we can date speleothems to tell how old they are, then we know that it took 1.4 million years for the Sierra Nevada mountains to raise about 50 meters or 50 yards. And from that we can get a rate. We've got a distance, the amount of, um, the amount of uplift through time. So it's like a speed. We know the velocity of uplift. And in this case, because even though most geologists would tell you the Sierra Nevada are um, 
uplifting very quickly. Um, in most human terms, it's very slowly. It's in quarters of a millimeter per year. So the Sierra Nevada uh, mountains are uplifting very quickly um, in geologic terms, and that equates to about a quarter of a millimeter per year. Doesn't sound like much in human terms, but geologically that adds up pretty quickly. All right, so let's come back to speleothems for a second. That's gonna be the focus of most of the rest of our discussion today. Um, speleothems are these formations, the pretty stuff that, that form in caves. Uh, we've got several different types. Of course, you've heard of stalactites, which hang tight to the ceiling, and stalagmites, which grow on the floor and might reach the ceiling. Um, and when stalactites and stalagmites grow together, they form a column. Um, flowstone is a type of uh, speleothem that forms as water drips and uh, precipitates out calcite, um, often on the floor or the walls. A little different than a stalagmite, but still calcite. And then another common type are soda straws. These are similar to stalactites, but they're hollow and shaped like a straw. Um, for the most part, when we talk about reconstructing climate from cave sediments, we're talking about stalagmites and stalactites. Um, how do these things form? Another good question. Let's answer that. So this diagram um, shows a cartoon with a stalactite on the ceiling, stalagmite on the floor. Let's start all the way up in the atmosphere, though. First, um, water condenses from vapor way up in the clouds, condenses into a water droplet, and falls towards the Earth. As it's falling towards the Earth, um, gases are dissolved and incorporated into the water droplet because you start out with pure water, but certain gases like CO2 and oxygen are very soluble, and just the fact that that water molecule is falling through the air will dissolve some of those gases into the water. Well, our water droplet, our raindrop, now it hits the earth, hits the soil. It's been enriched with carbon dioxide and oxygen and other gases from the atmosphere. Now it starts to move through the soil. Well, the soil is enriched with carbon dioxide because of processes of plant um, transpiration and respiration, um, plant decomposition, other processes in the soil tend to build up CO2 there. So as the water molecule infiltrates the soil, it dissolves even more CO2. The more CO2 it dissolves, the more acidic it becomes. Then that acidic water moves into the bedrock, in this case limestone, because we're going to make a cave, and that limestone is composed of calcite, that's the mineral that makes up limestone, and that acidic water is able to dissolve calcite, which dissolves in an acid. So our rainwater now, which has been supercharged with CO2, um, starts to dissolve limestone, and it carries that limestone downward until it, it comes into the cave, maybe enters the cave at a crack in the ceiling. Well, now it enters the cave, and the cave atmosphere has a different amount of CO2 in it. And that different amount of CO2 in the cave atmosphere may cause um, some of the CO2 to outgas from the water to sort of equilibrate with the cave atmosphere. Well, if you take CO2 out of the water droplet, that causes its pH to rise or become less acidic, which means now it's got all this calcite in solution, but it can't hold that much calcite because it's lost some of its acid and that calcite has to precipitate. So in scientific terms, we would say that as the CO2 is um, lost to the cave atmosphere, the water droplet becomes super saturated with calcite. Whenever you're super saturated, you'll start to precipitate things out. Not all that different than if you um, take a pot of water, boil it, dissolve a bunch of sugar in the water, and then let it cool. Eventually, as it cools, the water can no longer hold as much sugar in solution, and the sugar will precipitate back out as crystals, rock candy. Um, then, as that water droplet um, precipitates that calcite, just a little tiny crystal of calcite forms on the ceiling, and that happens year after year, day after day, year after year, millennia after millennia. Um, and that forms the stalactite out of all these tiny little precipitated crystals of calcite. Um, sometimes these stalagmites or stalactites may form so quickly that they almost get annual growth layers because the growth is faster in certain times of the year and certain other chemicals come through with the water that stain um, part. You get what look like tree rings. They may or may not be annual rings, 
but they're like rings and they're growth layers in the calcite. Um, then as that water drips to the floor, the impact of the water droplet on the floor can actually knock some more CO2 out, which causes even more supersaturation, which causes more precipitation and forms the stalagmite. But let's go back for a second and think about what just happened in this scenario. The water droplet was able to capture oxygen and carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and from the soil, transport that into the cave, precipitate that out as calcite. Now that oxygen that was captured in the atmosphere, that carbon dioxide which was captured in the atmosphere and in the soil, gets locked into the structure, the crystal structure of the speleothem as the mineral calcite. That means it's essentially frozen. Calcite is calcium, carbon, and oxygen. So the carbon and the oxygen that form the crystal structure of the, of the calcite are reflective of whatever types of oxygen and carbon dioxide we have in the atmosphere at the time that that water droplet rained out and moved through the soil and was precipitated. Now you may ask, I didn't know we had different types of carbon and oxygen in the atmosphere. Aren't all carbon and oxygen molecules the same? Turns out they're not. There are different isotopes of oxygen um, which are sort of like different flavors of oxygen and there are different isotopes of carbon, different flavors of carbon. And the ratio of these oxygen or carbon isotopes, so the amount of one isotope of oxygen to the other in the atmosphere at any one time is dependent on the average global temperature. So warmer, warmer climates, warmer periods of Earth history will have a different oxygen isotope ratio than cooler periods of Earth history. So a glacial period will have a different isotopic ratio than an interglacial period like today. And that's all being recorded in the, in the calcite in these speleothems. Similarly, the carbon, the carbon isotopes are strongly reflective of how arid or wet the climate is over the cave because a lot of this carbon dioxide's coming from the soil, a little bit from the atmosphere, but a lot from the soil. And of course, the soil carbon dioxide is a function of the plants that are growing in the soil. And if we have a dry climate or a wet climate, we'll get different plants. In a drier climate, we might have a prairie. In a wetter climate, we might have a forest. And they have different, they're associated with different carbon isotopic ratios. So it turns out then that these speleothems are recording in great detail, because remember, some of our growth layers may even be annual. They're recording almost at an annual basis um, the oxygen and carbon isotopic um, makeup of the atmosphere and the soil above the cave. Um, so this is a really valuable climatic archive. On top of that, there's one more piece to this puzzle. I said earlier that we could date speleothems. Well, the way that we date speleothems are they contain some uranium, and that uranium is an impurity in the limestone. So as that water molecule was moving through the limestone and dissolving it, um, it also picked up some of the uranium and then that uranium gets sort of trapped in the crystal structure of the calcite. Well, only the uranium comes out of the limestone. But once it's captured in the speleothem, it starts to decay to one of its daughter products, thorium. And because we know that half-life, we can look at the ratio within a speleothem or within a crystal within the speleothem, the ratio of the parent product, uranium, to the daughter product, thorium. And because we know the, the number of years in a half-life, we can use that ratio to figure out exactly how old, with a very high level of precision, that layer of the, of the uh, speleothem was. So now, not only do we have a record of what the atmosphere was like, but we have what we call a geochronometer, a geologic clock, geo geological chronometer clock, a geo clock that's recording the time when that crystal formed. So we have a high precision record of when the speleothem formed, or when that crystal within the speleothem formed, and when that oxygen isotope or carbon isotope um, ratio that's associated with that crystal represents in the geologic past. Um, there aren't many other archives on Earth that are as good at recording these ratios with such high precision and which, with such a good geochronometer as speleothems. So they're really valuable. Um, they're really valuable climate archives. Um, here I'm showing a speleothem that has been analyzed. Um, 
I believe this was a, it's just a good picture I was able to find online that shows the type of analysis that they do when they um, collect these. But they're drilling. You can see in the speleothem the different growth layers, sort of the colored banding, and they've highlighted some of those with the dark lines that have been over overdrawn on the speleothem. And then each of the black circles are a place where they've taken a sample. So they've used something like a dental drill that you use to, the dentist use to drill out a cavity to go in there and drill out just a little bit of the calcite and powder it. And then they can analyze that powder for the uranium thorium ratio to get the, the age, for the oxygen isotope ratio, and for the carbon ratio. Um, and you can see they do both vertical, which are different ages different time frames. The middle, central, bottom part of the speleothem would be the oldest part and the top, center part would be the youngest part. But they also do multiple analyses sometimes along a growth band just to see how consistent and to get some idea of replication and accuracy of the analyses. Um, so the other thing that I want to mention here and then we'll leave that and go on with how this uh, relates to climate is that to do these analyses, you have to remove the speleothem from the cave. And as we've talked about in different modules, we have a very strict um, sense of cave conservation and ethic. Um, breaking a speleothem off and taking it out of a cave is generally a big no-no. These things take hundreds of thousands of years or tens of thousands of years to form. And uh, if we just break them off willy-nilly and take them out of the cave, we're going to destroy the aesthetic of the cave. We're going to destroy that record that was there. Um, and it will take, you know, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of years for that damage to repair itself. But in this case, um, and there's a lot of conversation about this, there's always a lot of permission that's required, a lot of discussion. Uh, scientists will obtain permission and make a valid argument about why taking one or two speleothems out of a particular cave will have a scientific advantage about in informing us of cl past climate past climates that outweighs the downside of removing that. And of course, when they choose the ones to take, they have to choose ones that they know from experience will give them better quality data. But maybe they can go, if you have a big, um, a bunch of speleothems on a ceiling, they can take one from an inconspicuous spot where you might not even notice it's going, gone. Um, in other cases, I know um, uh, scientists have been able to use speleothems that were broken off already and on the floor of the cave, maybe broken off during flood events or by vandals and had been left on the floor of the cave and they were able to use those and not have to break any new ones off. All right, now moving on to what these can tell us. I've got three different um, examples here. The first is a paper from a paper written by uh, Jeff Doral and others in Science in 1998. Um, and the map on the left side of this shows the red line is the southern extent of glaciation during the last glacial period, the Wisconsin glaciation. So you can see that most of Minnesota, down into central Iowa, a lot of Wisconsin, um, northeastern Illinois, northern Illinois, or northern Indiana and Ohio were all covered by these glaciers. Missouri was south of this boundary. Missouri is uniquely positioned here on a lot of boundaries. It's just south of the glacial maximum just south of the area that was glaciated, but never glaciated itself in this last go round. Um, but we're kind of far from the oceans and their influences. So we're squarely here in the middle of the continent. And uh, also on the boundary in North America between more arid and more um, temperate climates. So to our west of Missouri through most of these glacial periods, we tend to have drier climates that are characterized by prairies. To our east, we tend to have wetter climates that are characterized by um, deciduous forests. And in between those two vegetation regimes, we tend to have savannas, which are a mixture of, of uh, prairie and trees, um, and so forth. And as the climate warms and dries or cools and gets wetter, these different biomes sort of march back and forth across Missouri through time. So first of all, let's look at the, the data for in this picture is from Crevice Cave, which is labeled there in southeastern Missouri. Um, and I'm not going to go into how to interpret isotopic curves. However, we'll just focus on the very left or the very right side of the graph. 
And what you'll see there is the graph goes from 25,000 years ago on the upper part of the y-axis to 75,000 years ago in the lower part of the y-axis. And this is the oxygen isotope curves. The further the oxygen isotope curve is to the left indicates a cooler Earth and increasing ice volume. The further it is to the right is a warming Earth and a lower ice volume. What you see is that about 75,000 years ago, we had a lower ice volume. Um, at different points in the past, ice volume's higher. And right now, it's, it's obviously we don't have much ice volume at all in North America. So um, this is a proxy then for not only ice, the oxygen isotopes are a proxy not only for ice volume, but for temperature, warmer, cooler Earth. So we have this data from southeastern Missouri that's telling us something about global, uh, global climate change and temperatures. But we were, they were also, the authors of this study were also able to analyze the carbon from, um, the carbon isotopes from this, these speleothems. And this is a, a very stark um, delineation here. What you see is about 75,000 years ago, and here I'm looking at the rightmost graph, um, or the second from the right, if the rightmost part is labeled forest, savanna, prairie, forest. It's the graph just to the left of that. You see that we were in forest about 75 to 70,000 years ago, gradually dried into savanna, all the way into prairie by about 50,000 years ago, and then very rapidly after 50,000 years ago, the climate became wetter and we reverted back to a forested setting, which has been typical of that part of uh, Missouri over the last 50,000 years. So here the speleothems have recorded um, the a record that helps us reconstruct the vegetation in the area over the cave and its carbon dioxide from the carbon ratios in the atmosphere. Um, our last example um, uses Devil's Icebox Cave, which is in Boone County in central Missouri, which is part of Rockbridge State Park, a great state park if you ever have the opportunity to visit it. Um, you can take the cave tour there if you're there at the right time of the year. Um, and here are the authors of this study, which was published in 2007 in Quaternary Research, um, were able to take the um, a spe two speleothems from Devil's Icebox Cave and reconstruct both the oxygen and the carbon isotopic ratios. The bottom curve with the open circles on the graph on the right here, the bottom curve is the oxygen isotopic ratios. And what you see is that it goes up and down a little bit, but more or less if we put a best fit line through the oxygen isotopic ratios, we'd have a, a more or less flat line. And on this graph, time goes from on the x-axis from zero on the left to 4,000 4, years ago on the, uh, on the right. So this is a, a record from the speleothems of the last 4,000 years. Um, so that means that the oxygen isotope ratios haven't changed. Um, there hasn't been any net change over the last 4,000 years, just a little up and down, which means the temperatures have been pretty steady over that period. However, you look at the, the other curve with the black circles, that's the carbon ratio, and you see that those carbon isotopic ratios have varied quite a bit, and this matches with the carbon isotopic ratio trends that we saw from Crevice Cave in the previous study, um, a whole different part of Missouri, but we see from this from the carbon that we have drier periods and wetter periods as the vegetation over top of the cave have been dominated by vegetation representing those climatic differences. So now I've given you some examples of how um, speleothems in Missouri have been used to reconstruct temperatures, glacial, glacial advances and retreats, vegetation patterns in the state and in the middle part of the North America, and um, periods of wetter and drier um, climates. So there's a rich history of climatic data that we've been able to extract from speleothems in Missouri and from elsewhere in the world. And uh, caves and their sediments then are very important repositories that are helping us understand the longer term trends in climate change and give us some context to understand the, uh, the rapid changes that we're documenting in our current instrumental record. So thank you for joining me for this module on climate and our climate archives and caves and Missouri caves and speleology. Um, we'll see you next time. Thank you.